Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here. My name is Jenea Crevier, um, and I'm a data analyst at Maps Core, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, the story of Maps Core, what we do, um, and a little bit about my work. <coughs> um, but first, I have a little history lesson, if you can bear with me. Um, show of hands, how many of you have heard of W.E.B. Du Bois? Of course. Yeah, most of you. Good. Um, how many of you knew he headed a sociological laboratory at Atlanta University with a network of black young men and women? Um, yeah, okay, a lot fewer of you. So, um, so he ran this laboratory at Atlanta University that was basically pioneering socio sociology research about the social conditions of black Americans at the turn of the century. <coughs> According to Professor Mabel Wilson of Columbia University, quote, the core mission of Du Bois' sociological research was to forcefully refute the widespread belief that black Americans were innately inferior, end quote. Now, many of these field researchers, as I mentioned, were black young women, such as pictured here. <coughs> and I don't just mention this because it's a nice story that says that there were also black scientists 120 years ago. I'm bringing this up because these young black women and men were actively combating white supremacist pseudoscience of the day <coughs> with on-the-ground research and innovative data visualization. Their work resulted in groundbreaking methods and sociological research that are still being used today. Now, Du Bois famously said that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. Well, here we are in the 21st century, and if any of you know Chicago or any major U.S. city, to be honest, uh, you know that those problems are still with us. Um, the effects of white supremacy are still working themselves out in our everyday lives. <clears throat> so I just ask you to keep that story in mind as I share with you um, the work of MAPS Corps. Ten years ago, at the University of Chicago, a group of researchers led by Dr. Stacy Lindau were investigating a core question. How do we understand health in our communities? And they came to a consensus. Health is not only the absence of disease, but also the presence of social, mental, and physical well-being. Now, out of many aspects involved in that well-being, uh, one key aspect is the presence of a rich ecosystem of businesses and ass assets that allow residents to get what they need in their own neighborhood to get well and stay well. So this group of researchers, they purchased the best available data they could find. And they handed it out to the community partners at the table and they said, take a look at this. This is what, these are the assets that we were able to find that are supposedly in your community. And within minutes, the partners said, these data are no good. You know, the places that it says are there, they're, they're not there anymore, or they're entered incorrectly, or places are missing that should be there. And so as a you know, university research group, they had an interest in developing a better data set. But the partners at the table gave that research group a mandate that said, great, you want to develop a better data set? Hire young people to do it. Because for us, health also means jobs, and it means involving young people. And second, make that data freely available to anyone who's interested in promoting health in our communities. So that's how MAPS Corps was born. Now from 2009 until 2015, it operated out of the University of Chicago's Lindau Lab, which is a physician's research lab. And in 2016, we became an independent nonprofit. Here's how it works. <coughs> every summer, teams of young people map every block on the south and west sides. <coughs> a team of four high school students pairs up with one college-age student near peer mentor and they take a census of all the public-facing businesses and organizations that they see. They do this using our custom-built data collection technology. So uh, what you see on the right is the map app, which they're walking around with phones, entering the data about the places that they see. Um, they're able to sort of map their routes and plan how they're going to go. Um, on the left, we have uh, our admin tool, which allows the supervisors to sort of plan assignments and divvy up all the work that needs to be done. In the process, they learn key STEM skills, so carry them through a curriculum, essentially. Um, what you see here is the curriculum program model, like how it all fits together. <coughs> they learn skills such as hypothesis development, data entry, 
um, data visualization, and they develop recommendations based on what they've found in the communities that they've mapped. And they present those recommendations to citywide stakeholders at our annual scientific symposium. At the end of every summer, all the data they collect is cleaned <coughs> and published on our website. You can explore it on your own in semi-interactive maps, or you can request it. If you're using it for non-commercial purposes, um, you, can, you can request it for free. So our data, our data sharing partners come from across sectors. Um, just to give you a bit of an idea of the folks using our data, um, NowPow is a healthcare technology company. They use our data um, to allow healthcare practitioners co to connect their patients with local resources. Um, our data are also available on the Chicago Health Atlas in partnership with the uh, Chicago Depart Department of Public Health. Um, and they're also put to use at sort of more hyper-local levels, for example, in building quality of life plan in Austin. Uh, in more recent years, we've leveraged a sort of youth mapping um, structure to also collect data beyond just the annual asset census. So we have boots on the ground, we have young people collecting data literally across the entire south and west sides. Um, and that sort of mechanism we've used to collect custom data sets. For example, um, we partner with Cook County Land Bank to collect further information about um, vacant and distressed lots so that they can work with communities to put those lots back into meaningful use. Uh, over, the 20, over the summer of 2018, um, we partnered with Elevated Chicago and we had, I think it was like 10 young people, not very many, but within the space of two or three weeks, they collected over 700 surveys of community members um, gathering data about community perceptions of transit stations. Um, so that's sort of a sample of all the different ways that um, our data is being used. Um, we're actively interested in partnering um, with mission-aligned folks to develop more custom-based data collection projects. Um, so if that's something that you or your organization would be interested in, please talk to me afterwards. Um, and the asset mapping census sort of model has been replicated nationally. So we license our technology to local partners who then conduct their own asset censuses in their communities, uh, hiring local youth. And we have programs in New York City and in two rural areas in North Carolina. So I'm gonna switch gears now from discussing sort of the history of MAPS Core and uh, the model and tell you a little bit about um, some of the work that I've been doing as a data analyst, um, some of our more recent work. <coughs> so in 2018, um, we reached the 10-year mark, 10 years of collecting data about community assets. And so for the first time, I compiled all of this into an interactive, we call it community asset report. Basically, we wanted to see what's the distribution of assets, what does that look like over time, um, so if you go to mapscore.org slash explore, you can view some interactive visualizations that get, will give you a sense of sort of the distribution of assets. Um, here on the left, you see assets per 1,000 people in this bluish purple. And, um, excuse me. and on the right, you see assets per square mile. So you can see distribution across geography, um, distribution across years, how have um, assets per 1,000 people, has that changed in a given community over a number of years? Now, as you can see here, we haven't mapped every community in every single year. We started with the core of six communities around the University of Chicago and Hyde Park and that sort of area, and now we've expanded to the entire south and west sides. Um, and you can also sort of investigate the distribute, like how your community compares to other communities when it comes to certain asset types, say like childcare and education assets or religious assets and things like this. And finally, with this report, we wanted to contextualize our asset data in some way. Um, it's definitely a toe in the water, and there's a lot more work to be done here. But um, we looked at our data in the context of some other factors. So for example, um, median household income. And what we found with certain asset types is that generally, there's a positive correlation between number of assets per 1,000 people and household income, which you would maybe kind of intuitively expect. OK, you have a wealthier community. That means that um, they have more businesses and more assets. But it wasn't true, actually, in every asset type. For example, 
um, with religious assets, there was actually a negative correlation. So the higher, um, higher an income, in a median income in a community, the fewer religious assets you could expect to find there. Um, so I'd encourage you to explore this. Um, I'd love to have, hear your feedback. Um, we're definitely iterating on this as we go and have a lot to learn. Um, so that's sort of the asset report. Um, and finally, I just want to close with a, a small story from the development of this report. We engaged seven or eight uh, young people in um, creating a couple of the metrics that are embedded in this report. And um, one, of, one of the exercises we did with them, so we have a custom taxonomy that, by which the young people like, categorize what the type of business is. And so we took our taxonomy categories and we were working with the youth to sort them in a couple of different buckets. Health, peace, and youth well-being, the concept being like these are the opposite of a lot of negative stereotypes that you hear about high poverty communities. You know, you hear all about in the news always about violence and about illness and so on. And so these buckets were sort of like foils to that. <coughs> and they were putting the different asset types into these buckets. One surprising categorization that they made, they put fast food restaurants in the category of youth well-being. Now, from the perspective of, say, a health researcher, that might not be very intuitive. So we had conversations with them and said, well, what's going on there? They said, look, these are the places where we get our first jobs. These are the places that we hang out with our friends. Um, and so in a unique way, they are an asset to us. Now, I'm not saying that fast food restaurants are the key to the most beautiful communities in Chicago. Um, <laughs> But what I'm saying is that black and brown youth lend an essential perspective to how we do social science and how we understand what's going on in our communities. Just like 120 years ago, you had black women and men pioneering ways that, to think about sociology and think about how we understand our communities. These young people need to be at the table. They need to be front and center at the table if we want to build a Chicago where everyone can access what they need in their own neighborhoods. So, um, yeah, thank you all for your attention. Thank you for being here. Um, I have a sample of our data for the more data-oriented among you. If you want to play around with it, we're just going to kind of play around with it, look for patterns. Um, I don't have it super structured in that way. but um, And uh, I also have a book full of data visualizations from Du Bois and his lab, uh, if you want to look through that. Um, it really informs a lot of my work as a data practitioner. Um, and, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so thank you, this is great. Um, so I've been around long enough to realize that there's like a constant re recycling of this sort of need that people keep identifying is that like, oh, we just need to know where all the assets are. And I feel like I've heard that conversation started over like the eight or nine years I've been like active in the sort of tech Chicago uh, and civic space. So I'm just kind of curious, from your perspective, since you've been doing this for 10 years and actually doing it and not just talking about doing it, which is where I feel like a lot of the conversation ends up stopping at the, that's a great idea, let's do it. Um, I'm kind of curious your thoughts on how this conversation has evolved and how do you kind of handle, or maybe if you've experienced that same uh, perception that I have had around people trying to sort of reinvent this wheel and how do you engage with that well-intended but oftentimes like like really annoying kind of uh, engagement around the thing you do every every day. That's a really good question. Um, so we kind of have versions of that conversation a lot because our data set is um, it just categorizes places by their primary service. So for example, a church is just a church in our database. It doesn't say whether it has a food pantry or whether they have you know mental health resources or anything like that. And so. We sort of have iterations of this conversation all the time. Um, I think a big strength and really the like how our work is grounded and how it happens is the fact that um, we have really strong community partnerships since 10 years ago. The people who were at the table are also the or, like heading organizations that were willing to hire the youth, and we meet with them every month still and talk about like what's working, what's not, like how what sorts of re questions can these youth investigate that will be useful to you. Um, so I think those maintaining those partnerships um, in a way that benefits everyone involved is key, but um, also I don't have like the perfect answer because we're kind of always in that 
loop a little bit. Um, but also just like trying something and like being forthright with everyone involved that we're trying, like this is a pilot, say. Like for example, this last year we did a pilot about like collecting um, data on resources available for immigrants in the suburbs. Um, and yeah, it was a pilot and we learned some things. And like we just had to sort of be upfront with people. It wasn't perfect, um, but, but committing to iterating um, is also really important, so yeah. Awesome. Uh, my question is how do you arrive at the questions that you're looking to answer with the data? That that yeah, so primarily we just take a census of everything as our sort of core like legacy program, I guess, is taking a census of all of the things. That said, there are custom surveys that we will do. Um, so as I mentioned, each of our community partners, they really ground our work and host the youth throughout the summer and, and all of this. And so um, we have monthly meetings with them and leading up to this summer as they're figuring out, well, what problem or what question are we interested in investigating that these youth could help us with. Um, we, um, we basically work with them in developing a short survey. Um, so it's really driven by their work and their priorities and um, what they understand to be needs in their community. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, I was curious with the mapping assessments that you discussed, a natural uh, complement to that seems to be needs assessments. And I was wondering in your organization how the conversation around that was driven forward if like the data collection process also had an eye towards like what gaps existed in addition to the asset? Yeah. Um, so we make a lot of the people who request our data are interested in doing needs assessments, but we're just, the census we take is of everything you see when you're walking down the street. So our method doesn't actually assume any need other than the need for a complete data set. So, um, so every year when we expand into a new community, um, we purchase like a secondary data set and that's what it serves as the baseline, like what goes into the app for the youth to validate. Um, and we find that anywhere from 17% to like 30% of um, the places that they map are new, like did not exist in the secondary data set that we purchased. So that's really the need that our core program core program focuses on um, and then uh, we share data with a lot of people who are doing sort of needs assessment they'll sort of take all right this is the chunk of assets we call them assets right just public facing businesses and organizations that are in my community and then do different kinds of analyses on them yeah great question Any questions? hi thanks for your presentation uh, can you talk a little bit about how you got to the mobile technology that is being used in the field survey? Did you start out that way 10 years ago? What was it built on? How has it evolved? What does it take to customize it? Yeah, that's a nice question. I'm pretty much the like product and project manager for the whole uh, technology suite. So, um, But it was not always, uh, it did not always exist. From what I understand, I think they went out at the beginning with like clipboards and so on. Um, and in 2015 or 16 was when the technology was built. Um, and so pretty much we do major updates every year um, based on feedback from the mappers, from their supervisors, like what's working, what isn't working, how can we make this better. Um, obviously with nonprofit we have some kind of limited resources, um, so it tends to only happen once a year, um, and then sort of bug fixes as we go. Um, yeah, so for example, the map like features were very new um, and have been pretty helpful to people in terms of um, just like decreasing the amount of time that they have to spend figuring out where places are. Yeah. Thank you. Um, is the involvement of young people in the project an attempt to help them build skills in spatial thinking and data that they might take into their future careers, and if that is the goal, is there uh, some history in terms of kids that started with you eight or nine years ago, that where are they now? Yeah, that's a great question. So that is the goal. We do um, sort of career days and, and that sort of thing over the course of the summer, and um, we have about 20% of both the high school and the college students return the next year to our program, um, and we're working on sort of tracking how much sort of STEM involvement is 
um, our program leads people into, but that is sort of the idea. Um, yeah, my coworker is in the back, maybe he would want to answer that a little more, but <laughs> yeah. No, you're good, okay. Never mind. No, 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 you're good. <laughs> yeah. First of all, and apologize for getting a phone call and interrupting this. I, I was just totally in the zone. No um, so I kind of want to follow up with the, the young kids getting involved. Uh, what kind of data do you have in terms of uh, how you were able to keep the engagement? And uh, like what age and what attention span? I'm, I'm curious about this uh, for educational topics of engagement like this. Uh, have you have any data on that? I'm sorry, could you rephrase the question? Yeah, um, so I'm curious, oh, Just let's just try to simplify it. Um, how do you guys keep it so younger kids stay involved? Because you know their attention span is so limited, they're always on their phones or jump into the next thing. And h how do you encourage them to stay uh, in one project and complete it before moving on to the next? Yeah, I mean, I would sort of respond with a caveat, like not to underestimate them. <laughs> um, <laughs> like young people can do a lot. Um, our program is an after school matters program. So they, uh, well, it's funded through after school matters and one summer Chicago as well. And so they're, you know, ages 16 through 19. So some of them are like basically adults. Um, and also like the program itself is fairly active. Um, you know, you're walking anywhere from like five to seven miles a day taking public transportation. Um, and yeah, I would say, um, the responses we get from a lot of young people is that they learn stuff about their own neighborhood that they didn't know, um, and that tends to tends to be really energizing. Um, and also, um, also they're working towards the like towards the end presentation. It's it's almost like a mini conference, really, the symposium, um, and so that's like very high stakes. Um, and also, just like in terms of youth development, like programs, it's um, that tends to really serve people well when they have like a really clear goal in mind. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Please give it up again for our speakers.